Um, good morning, everyone, and welcome uh, to the second meeting of the Local Government and Communities Committee. Can I remind everyone present to turn off mobile phones as they can interfere with the sound system and as meeting papers are provided in digital format and tablets may be used uh, by members during the meeting. So that's what we're doing if, if you see us uh, doing that. Uh, no apologies have been received for this morning's meeting and we'll move straight to agenda item one. Uh, where we have the Minister for Local Government and Housing with us. So we will take evidence from the Minister uh, on key areas of his portfolio. So can I welcome Kevin Stewart, Minister for Local Government and Housing. Good morning, uh, Kevin. And also welcome uh, Donna McKinnon, Head of Local Government and Analytical Services Division, John McNearney, the Chief Planner, and Caroline Dix, More Homes Division, Scottish Government. Uh, so you're all very welcome. Uh, thank you for coming along this morning. Um, Minister, uh, we've indicated that it would be good if you could make an opening statement to committee this morning before we move to questions. Uh, thank you, convener, and can I welcome you and other members to their roles in uh, this committee. Uh, and I thank you for the opportunity to speak to the committee this morning. Uh, and to discuss uh, the wide range of issues in my portfolio. I have to say it's uh, certainly different to be on this side of the table rather than at your side of the table, convener. Um, my portfolio is both a challenging and interesting one. Uh, you'll have noticed I now have aspects of work of two previous ministers. I look forward to working closely with the committee while I serve as the Minister for Local Government and Housing. <laughs> Whilst there is uh, much in my remit for me to cover, can I also say what I don't cover? Um, the Local Government Boundary Commission is now within the remit of the Minister for Parliamentary Business. Local Government Finance, including Council Tax Reform, remains with the remit of the Finance Secretary. Uh, now I'd like to make a few remarks about areas within my remit. Uh, this government uh, wishes to reinvigorate local government by reconnecting it with communities. Our aim is to transform our democratic landscape while protecting and renewing public services. One size does not fit all, but the principle of enabling local control, not on behalf of a community, but by a community, will be key in all that we do. This will allow us to realise further our community empowerment agenda uh, and require local government and its partners to relocate influence and control over some functions and local services closer to communities. A central aim will be to further enhance local accountability and the quality of service provision, taking account of Scotland's different geographies, from islands through the mainland council areas, cities and their surrounding city regions. Government has already recognised that the right solutions for people may differ across Scotland's diverse communities. No one size will fit all. We will work with local authorities to review their roles and responsibilities and get more powers into the hands of communities. The Community Empowerment Act passed by the last Parliament provides a framework which will empower community bodies through the ownership of land and buildings and strengthening their voices in the de decisions that matter to them. We are developing the necessary secondary legislation and guidance, three consultations on community planning, asset transfer and participation requests have been published and we will continue working with stakeholders to implement the Act. Community planning in Scotland continues to improve both locally and nationally, but we recognise the pace of improvement needs to step up. We expect that the Community Empowerment Act, together with other measures, will further increase the pace and extent of improvement. On participatory budgeting, we have committed to set councils a target of having at least 1% of their budget subject to community choices budget, budgeting and continuing to support the effective implement, implementation of the Community Empowerment Act. We are currently looking at how the new commitment can be de developed in collaboration with our stakeholders. The government has an excellent track record on housing. We exceeded our target to deliver 30,000 affordable new homes, which included more than 20,000 for social rent. We have listened to what our partners uh, say in terms of increasing the pace and the momentum of housing delivery. Our bold and ambitious target over the next five years is to deliver at least 50,000 affordable homes, of which at least 35,000 will be for social rent. Communities flourish when people have good quality, warm, comfortable homes to live in. 
That's why this government's priority is to increase the scale and the pace of the supply of the right homes in the right places, particularly in the affordable rented and private rented sectors. Scottish ministers are committed to ensuring we have a planning system that works for everyone. An independent panel completed a root and branch review of Scotland's planning system, publishing its report on the 31st of May. Scottish ministers are considering the recommendations put forward by the panel and will publish our response in due course. Thank you once again for the opportunity to speak to you this morning uh, and I look forward to answering your questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Minister. Uh, in a moment, I'm going to bring in my colleague, Andy Whiteman, who I know wishes to, to ask some questions in relation to housing, as, as I do. So perhaps we could, we could start off there. Um, now, I have no doubt um, that there's been a significant increase in the affordable housing budget and there's ambitious targets there. But, but can I ask you, um, do you believe there's enough capacity within the housing sector to make sure that these targets can be met? And in relation to those targets as well, Minister, uh, would you see those targets as being where communities wish houses to be built in the most appropriate places, perhaps brownfield sites, for example, rather than, say, greenbelt development where some local authorities are aggress aggressively releasing land because it's easier for development, but not always necessarily what communities wish. So is there enough uh, capacity within the construction sector to, to meet those targets uh, within the budget allocated? And how do we make sure we actually get the houses uh, built uh, where communities wish them to be built? Uh, thank you, Convener. Well, obviously, we have set ourselves a, a challenging target of 50,000 uh, affordable homes. Um, and uh, what my job is, is to ensure that everything aligns uh, to make sure um, that that happens. Um, at very early stage, uh, I've already spoken to uh, a number of folk and organisations um, who are pretty enthusiastic, I have to say, about the government's uh, target. In terms of capacity, uh, we've seen in recent times an, an increase in the amount of apprentices who have entered into construction. Um, I had a meeting yesterday with um, Homes for Scotland to talk about some of the challenges that they face, and we will try and help overcome that. Uh, and the other thing which you mentioned, of course, uh, is to ensure um, that planning uh, is aligned with uh, our, our ambition uh, to, to build these 50,000 houses. Um, I think it comes as no surprise that um, planning uh, and housing are, are within my remit. And what I need to do with uh, my officials uh, is to make sure that everything aligns so that that 50,000, at least 50,000 uh, target is met. Okay, um, thank you, Miss, for that answer. Now, uh, you mentioned the, the significant budget that's been allocated. I assume the government has done some modelling work in relation to the 35,000 minimum uh, social housing uh, units that were part of that 50,000 target. Can I ask you, is that something that you might now have to review in relation to the uncertainty within uh, various sectors of the Scottish and UK economy following the, the, the Brexit vote? Do you have any concerns in relation to additional costs in the sector? Could this compromise the Scottish Government's ambition for 50,000 affordable houses? And even if it doesn't, can you give us some more information in relation to uh, the cost assumptions that sit within the monies allocated? Uh, I'll bring Caroline Dixon at a point, but let me start by uh, talking about what has happened over the past um, few days, which, of course, is extremely worrying. Uh, and, of course, the First Minister uh, has been doing all that she can uh, to ensure that, uh, to instil uh, confidence. But we have seen over the past few days since the result came in on Friday morning of the European Union referendum, we've seen uh, house builders and uh, lenders being severely hit by the shock uh, this, to the stock markets and uh, share prices have fallen by as much as 40%, um, although both sectors seem to have recovered a little bit yesterday as markets stabilised. But in discussion with Homes for Scotland yesterday, obviously they have concerns. Um, we, I heard of a situation yesterday from Homes for Scotland uh, where 
one of their members was saying that already they had had a, a Polish family withdraw um, from a house sale because they uh, were feeling uh, a little bit worried uh, about the situation. I think it's up to all of us uh, to, to try and uh, boost confidence of the European nationals who live here, who have come to work here, uh, and who are welcome here. And I'm glad that all of the leaders of uh, our political parties joined with the First Minister yesterday uh, to, to reiterate the fact that people are welcome here. Uh, but we do have a difficulty, I think, in terms of building uh, that confidence. Obviously, uh, we are in early days um, uh, in terms of uh, the, the fallout from the result last Friday. Uh, you can be assured um, that I will be keeping uh, a close eye on the implications uh, of that result, uh, as will all of my officials. Um, I, I've already said to Homes for Scotland and others who I've spoken to since that if they have any information to feed in um, about anything that is happening out there, um, then to please do so, uh, so that we can analyse exactly what is happening. Um, and if uh, I can beg your indulgence now, convener, I'll bring in Caroline Dix. Okay. Um, you asked about the modelling in terms of the government's targets, specifically for 35,000 social homes. The important part of the government's budget in terms of delivering those homes is the grant element of the budget that goes to housing associations and councils. And in the current financial year, that's been increased significantly to reflect the, the increase in the, the government's ambition and targets. So, for example, in the current year, the grant budget in the housing supply budget has increased by 100 million to support that programme. Um, again, as the Minister has said, we work closely with our stakeholders and um, earlier in the year we uh, discussed with both councils and housing associations the level of subsidy they would need to deliver the social homes and the government increased the grant subsidy that was available to these organisations to allow the homes to be built. Now, I know there's no such thing as a, a, a typical home, but there used to be a kind of a working assumption that, um, if you like, the, the bog standard home, and I, apologies, that's not terminology, would have a certain level of housing association, a housing association grant. So what is the, 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 the notional housing association uh, subsidy grant at present? I'll bring in Ms Dix. Okay. Uh, it, it depends. We have, um, we have a table that shows um, different grant subsidy levels for different parts of the country and we can provide that table to the committee so you can see the detail of that. So for example, um, the grant subsidy for a council home is about £57,000. Um, that reflects the increase that I was just talking about. Um, and then we've got different subsidy levels for housing associations that might be building in the central belt in the urban areas. We apply a higher subsidy, for example, if housing associations are working in very remote rural areas or in island communities where costs might be higher, so our subsidies will reflect that. We can supply you all of the detail of this in some depth, uh, convener, if you so wish. Um, obviously, the question that you've asked is quite technical and there are uh, a number of answers uh, to that question. So we can supply the committee uh, with the breakdown of those grants so that you have uh, a full knowledge uh, of, of what it actually means. Because uh, as you can probably gather from Ms Dick's answer, one size doesn't fit all here. Um, Absolutely, Minister. I'm, I'm very much aware of that, and that that information would be very helpful. But the committee will need some comparisons because obviously, the the question I'm trying to tease out is whether it becomes more ex expensive to to build than it previously would have been if greater subsidies are needed going forward. And there's no such thing as a typical housing association grant subsidy, of course. But that if there's a table out there and a framework out there that allows us to see if that's needed to be changed, because the Scottish government in previous years have had to change that level of subsidy. To, to meet their, their housing targets. Uh, I thank you for those answers. And I've got a couple of supplementaries before I, I bring Andy in. So, take Kenny Gibson first. Yeah, yeah it's just, uh, uh, good morning, Minister. Uh, thanks, Convener. Uh, one of the things I was wanting to know about the 50,000 houses, how are they going to be allocated in terms of geographic spread? Is it going to be demand-led, for example, or is it going to be proportionate? And I'm thinking about my own area, 2.5% of Scotland's population. Would we get 2.5% of the houses, for example? Now, demand may be lower in our area, 
but at the same time employment is also a lot lower and unemployment is a lot higher. So ironically, if it's demand-led, a lot of the jobs in construction would therefore be directed to places where there's already high levels of unemployment and areas which have got low unemployment would, uh, um, of high un unemployment would obviously suffer. So I'm just wondering what the, the Scottish Government's thinking about this because the, we could end up with a disparity and it could increase the, the difference between the more prosperous and less prosperous areas of Scotland. Uh, obviously, um, this is going to be driven by need, and obviously, uh, each area uh, has its own assessment um, in terms of its housing need. Um, Mr Gibson uh, rightly talks about his own constituency, as uh, he always does in this place. Um, I'll be visiting our Drossen in the very near future um, to, to visit a, a, a new build site there. Um, I'm keen... Uh, to get around about the country uh, and talk to stakeholders uh, in local government and in housing associations uh, to see what they think um, is required. I've already spoken uh, to the Scottish Federation of Housing Associations uh, and uh, the discussions there um, will continue. Uh, but the key thing for the government is to make sure that these houses are built um, in the right places where there is actual need. Uh, without naming uh, a, a, an area, um, just the other week uh, there was a suggestion that we should build uh, more houses in a, a certain part of Scotland, but the reality is that the housing need there um, is almost nil, um, I've been told. Now, it would be pointless for us to build homes which remain empty. Um, but in terms of opportunity for all, in terms of the programme. Uh, I'm keen to see um, this uh, programme, which uh, will support some 14,000 jobs. I'm keen to, to see um, that there are benefits felt right across the country. Um, and in particular, um, I would like to uh, ensure um, that we have all of the right skill sets, as the convener mentioned earlier, uh, and opening up uh, opportunities for apprentices um, I was at North East College Aberdeen campus the other week and uh, was uh, pretty, pretty chuffed to, to hear apprentices there um, who were entering painting and decorating aspect of the construction industry. Pleased to hear how they had enjoyed their course and I would encourage uh, others uh, to, to uh, look at uh, entering uh, into uh, having jobs in the construction sector and, uh, and uh, as a cross-cutting government we've got to ensure that all of the right skill sets are there so that we can achieve um, uh, the, our programme right across the country. Um, so I, I'm sure that there will be opportunity for Mr Gibson's constituents uh, and for others as we move on with this ambitious target. Okay. Thank you very much, Minister. I'll wait a supplementary off of Elaine Smith, and then, although, Graham, you have indicated a supplementary, because Andy wished to speak about housing as well, to Andy and then I'll take yourself in, Graham. Okay, so Elaine. Thanks very much, Convener, and uh, welcome, Minister, to the Committee and your position, and thank you for joining us this morning. Um, I would like to pick up on something the Convener asked you in his first question, but I, I don't think that you fully responded, so if you don't mind me doing that. And it's the matter of building on the green belt, and I think um, probably around the table we've all got examples of where communities are getting upset about proposals. For example, in one community, there's a development plan to build in the green belt between Canberra and Calder Bank, so that's exercising the local community very much. And I just wondered um, if you could pick up on that, because the convener did raise it, uh, whether or not there would be some kind of um, presumption not to build on green belt, particularly for private developers, and to look for brownfield sites. Well, I think uh, a lot of these things are matters for local authorities to decide in terms of their local development plans. Um, uh, and obviously, uh, they have to look very carefully indeed when they come to, to formulate these plans. Um, I think we've, we've got a balance that needs to be struck because um, we do require land to build on because we do require um, a lot more uh, houses in this country. And um, I, I myself, as a constituency MSP, have heard somebody say in the past, yes, we need more houses, um, but I don't want them next to me. Um, and I think that we have got to strike the right balance. If we are going to 
achieve uh, our ambitious programme and beyond that see other house building across uh, other 10 years too, um, we have got to strike the right balance. Uh, obviously, we have had uh, the independent planning review of, of late um, and the government will give its, uh, its response to that review very, very uh, shortly uh, indeed. Um, but I am not going to dictate uh, to, to local authorities uh, where or where not they should be building. I, I think, you know, it's, uh, it's grand if we can get derelict and vacant land into use. I am keen to see that happen. Brownfield sites, as uh, the convener called them. But at the same time, um, if you want me to sit here and say um, that there will be no building on Greenbelt land, I cannot say that. Um, it is a matter for local authorities to get this right in, the local of in their local development plans. But beyond that, as I say, there is a balance that needs to be struck here. Everybody wants more houses. Um, we, need, we need the right land to build that on, them on. Thanks, Minister. Uh, Minister, I probably would want you to say that, but I appreciate that uh, clearly that's not something you're going to do. Could you just clarify, though, that it will be a matter for local authorities and that there has not been some change that if it's over a certain number of houses, it's going to be the Scottish Government that decides? Um, it will be up to local authorities uh, to look at uh, planning in their own particular locales. Also, might be quite helpful, Minister, is I know that the planning review is uh, on, ongoing, uh, but in relation to particularly large local authorities such, such as Glasgow, the local development plan gets fueled into MSPs uh, in about 20 boxes. It's so voluminous, um, and, and you, it, it's just impenetrable to the MSPs, never mind local communities, who are presented with fait accompli. So sometimes the issue is not about whether or not Greenbelt land is uh, uh, rezoned for housing, it's about whether or not communities actually have any idea uh, what uh, local authorities are intending to do in relation to local development plans. Uh, as, a, as an MSP for Glasgow, uh, I stay in a housing development adjacent to Greenbelt land, uh, a stone's throw away from it, uh, and I wasn't informed as a Glasgow MSP by the local authority that they were intending to rezone it. And that can build a lot of distrust amongst communities, irrespective of how they feel about land being rezoned. So I very much hope, in relation to the planning review that's ongoing, that the level of consultation, real and genuine, and not just tick box statutory consultation, is a meaningful part of any planning review. Um, the planning review um, has reported, of, of course, convener, as I said, the 31st of May it, it was published. Uh, and I would urge uh, members to, to have a look at, at that. As I say, the, the government uh, will respond to that review um, uh, in, in due course. Um, the, uh, the planning system should be development plan led um, and it should be open uh, and transparent. Um, I think, you know, one of the things which I'm keen to see, we've talked a lot about empowering people. Uh, I want to, to see um, consultations on development plans and other things uh, which are easily understandable, um, where people uh, have got the ability um, to have their say uh, and to, to influence. Now, having been in a, a council previously, um, uh, in, the, uh, in the previous uh, uh, local planning situation uh, and at the very beginning of this new planning si situation, I, uh, I realised that there are complexities um, sometimes uh, for folk to understand. We need to get rid of some of these complexities so that everybody can play a part in the formulation uh, of the, the plan um, for their area. And some of the work that has been uh, going on in, in, in terms of the, uh, of the Scottish Government's uh, planning directorate, um, I think, um, is, is uh, moving things forward apace. Um, we've seen much more use of charrettes in recent times. Um, I think that this publication, Play Standard, How Good Is Our Place, um, is something that everybody um, should read. Um, so openness, transparency, 
um, and uh, making things as easy as possible um, for uh, ordinary folk out there to engage in the system is the way that I want to, to move forward. And if you don't mind, um, convener, I'll maybe bring in Mr. McNerney here as well to add to my comments. Okay. Thank you, convener. Um, as the minister says, we, we aspire to a plan-led system. Um, and if communities can be fully involved in the policies and the allocations in that development plan, then they're, they're more likely uh, to feel that it represents a vision for their community. And I think one of the things that the review panel are saying is that um, planning needs to up its game in terms of community um, engagement and empowerment, um, not just in terms of making the development plan system more accessible to them, but also moving towards giving them the option of bringing forward their own proposals um, that might in turn be part of the development plan. So that early engagement is important. Um, and uh, the, the other point I would make is that um, it is clear that when there's interventions late in the system and the examination process, which consistently has felt um, that there's insufficient numbers coming through the development plan system, either allocates more land or looks for an early review, that can in itself cause tensions um, within the local community. So um, early engagement and front-loading, I think, is very much part of the, the system that we want to promote. Okay. Uh, can I maybe just add one other thing, convener, because um, I'm very aware um, that some communities are uh, much more able to respond to these kind of things than others. Um, and uh, I, I want to ensure um, that any community capacity building that's required also plays a part in that system. It's very helpful. And of course, you have to know what's happening irrespective of the capacity a community has before you can respond. But obviously, as you respond, the government responds to the, the review that's been published, that's something that you'll look at in, in some detail? Uh, um, we will, uh, as I say, uh, publish our response to um, the independent reviews recommendations uh, in very short course. It, it may be, it's not for me to, to um, say to the committee what to do, but you may want to actually talk to the, the, the folks who carried out the independent review um, about uh, how they reached their conclusions. Yeah, but I was just saying, uh, you're, the minute, you're the minister, Mr Stewart, that's, some, that, that's a key principle that, in responding to the independent review that's now been published, that you will take on board about how we make sure that communities are actually aware of what's happening within the local development process. The government's response to the independent review panel will come out in due course. If you wish to uh, take me back to the committee after that to discuss mm -hmm. um, our responses, I'm quite happy to do so, Mr Doris. Uh, well, I'm sure we will want to do that, absolutely. Uh, Andy Whiteman. Uh, thank you, <coughs> Convener. Thank you, Minister. Uh, you said in your opening remarks that uh, the Scottish Government has, quote, an excellent track record on housing, end quote. Um, and yet house building is down by almost 40% since 2007. And this is mostly as a consequence of the private sector. Um, do you think that the kind of model of house building we have in Scotland and the UK, the speculative volume house building industry, in comparison to the more self-built model that exists in the rest of Europe, is fit for purpose. And a second related question in, in relation to, to planning. One of the problems, it seems to me, and certainly in, in Edinburgh, we have a lot of land lying derelict, notably down by the waterfront. Uh, it's owned in offshore tax havens, and it's at risk, if it already has not, of dropping out of the five-year land supply purely because the, um, the owner's not in a position to bring it forward. Are you open to ideas as to how we can ensure that land that has consent for housing, that should be developed for housing, that there are mechanisms to ensure that that does happen and that the priorities and interests of the owner can't override the democratically expressed wishes of the local authority? Um, first of all, I, I, I do think the government has an excellent record in housing. We managed to achieve 33,490 uh, affordable houses, if I remember rightly, uh, in the last term. Obviously, this target is uh, much more uh, ambitious uh, than that. Um, I would say about self-build, which uh, featured in Mr Whiteman's question there, uh, we already have um, a, a fund uh, in the Highlands uh, for self-build at this moment. I've um, asked 
uh, for much more detail uh, in self-build. Um, I'm not going to, to rule anything in or out. I'm going to look very carefully um, at all aspects um, of uh, house building. Um, so Mr Whiteman can be assured that I will uh, look at self-build and if he uh, wants to write to me further uh, about that, then I will uh, lay out um, what what uh, I'm doing at this moment in time in that regard and what the, the government uh, is doing. Um, in terms of, uh, of land banking, because I think that's what uh, Mr Matt Whiteman was talking about, where land has already been given um, permissions, but um, uh, has, uh, nothing has been done. Um, obviously, uh, we will look um, at that situation. Um, I have to say uh, that uh, we have to uh, wait and see uh, what the repercussions of last week will do to the house building industry as a whole. Um, as I said earlier, um, the response to, to Friday's uh, decision was not particularly good. Um, I can assure the committee um, that uh, I will keep you informed of any repercussions uh, of that decision uh, on Friday. Yeah, going to come back on that, Mr. Whiteman. Uh, yes, I, I welcome the <coughs> opportunity to communicate further with you, Minister, and I will, I, I will, uh, I will do that. Um, I mean, my question was, the first question was whether you consider the speculative volume house building industry to be fit for purpose. There's no, there's no doubt that they have the capacity to build houses. The problem is they're not building houses, uh, and many people would argue that that's because of the very model of house building we have in this country, where. The vast majority of houses are built by a very small number of companies whose principal interest is as developers rather than house builders. Uh, well, I, I will look at all aspects of uh, housing policy. Um, as Mr Whiteman is well aware, my feet are just under the desk. Uh, I am looking at every aspect of housing, um, which includes uh, the uh, ability uh, to self-build, which, uh, by the sounds of it, Mr. Whiteman is keen on. Um, but I think, y you know, um, we have got to ensure um, that we build housing uh, across 10 years. Uh, obviously, um, the key thing for me is that 50,000 um, affordable uh, housing target. Um, but beyond that, you can be assured, the committee can be assured, convener, um, that I am going to look at all aspects uh, of housing uh, across uh, Scotland. And maybe I'll take in Miss Dix here. Yeah, uh, I, th I think as the Minister mentioned earlier, that um, there was a meeting yesterday with Homes of Scotland and there's a close contact with them as a stakeholder in terms of supporting um, the private sector. You mentioned um, statistics earlier in your question. Um, and the main way that the government's been supporting the sector is through the Help to Buy scheme. Um, and there was 305 million, I think, of support um, between 2013 and 2016 to support the sector to build homes for shared equity. And in the next three years, uh, a further 195 million has been provided by the government to, to keep that support going. In terms of smaller companies, there's a, a ring fenced amount within that budget for um, smaller um, builders. Um, and there's also engagement with smaller builders at the moment. There's a survey being done with them um, to look at what support they need to also engage in house building and to make sure that they're, they're supported too, as well as the, the bigger companies that might be accessing the help to buy scheme. I should say, Camino, that Homes for uh, Scotland are a key stakeholder. Uh, they uh, and their members uh, we will communicate with uh, constantly. Um, can I say that in terms of the Help to Buy scheme, which uh, Ms Dix has mentioned, uh, that uh, since 2007, um, the uh, Scottish Government has supported over 22,700 households uh, into uh, home ownership. Uh, three quarters of that is shared equity buyers who are under the age of 35. Okay, thanks, Minister. I'm sure we will return to housing uh, as a recurrent theme uh, in the lifetime of this committee. Can we move on for the moment? Uh, Graham Simpson with a new subject. Yeah, thank you. Um, and thanks for attending, Minister. Um, I think it's probably an opportune moment to declare an interest uh, in that I'm still a councillor in South Lanarkshire. Um, if we can move it on, um, if that's okay, onto your 
more general proposals for local government. Um, you told us at the at the start you want to relocate influence and control to local communities. Um, I'm not entirely sure what that means. Um, I wonder if you could put some flesh on the bones for that uh, and tell us if you've got any plans to uh, change the size and numbers of local authorities. Thank you, uh, Convener. Thank you, Mr Simpson. Um, I, uh, having done the dual role of MSP and councillor, uh, for a year myself, uh, I don't envy you at this moment in time. Um, I, uh, I uh, did that for 12 months too, and uh, it was uh, rather onerous. I think I coped, uh, uh, but uh, uh, others maybe have other things to say about that. Um, can I say that the, the government's manifesto uh, set out our intention to consult on and to introduce a bill uh, that will decentralise local authority functions, budgets uh, and democratic oversight to local communities. Uh, the timing of that bill uh, will be determined in due course uh, as part of the gov government's wider consideration uh, of the content of its future legislative programme. As I said earlier, um, we are clear that one size does not fit all. Uh, we'll continue to grow and develop city deals town centre partnerships uh, and regional economic partnerships so that clusters of agencies and shared interests can work together for the benefit of their local economies and communities. Uh, beyond that, uh, of course, we have the opportunity uh, of city region deals uh, and the re new regional economic uh, partnerships uh, too. Um, we will consult uh, and we will come back uh, and we will provide you with the timing of the bill at a later date, convener. To follow up on that, Mr. Simpson? That's okay, yeah. Um, so, I mean, you're talking about city regions. That, that, that would suggest to me that you may be thinking of, sort of merging functions in councils. Um, perhaps you could comment on that. Um, I'm uh, uh, convener, I'm talking about the city region deals that al already exist in, uh, in Aberdeenshire, uh, Aberdeen City in Aberdeenshire, uh, in Glasgow, uh, and soon uh, in, in Edinburgh and other places. So that's what I'm talking about. I'm not talking about merging anything. As I said, convener, um, we will consult uh, on our proposals uh, and we will come back uh, with the timing of a bill after that consultation, after we've taken the views of the people and stakeholders into account. Yeah. Anything to add one, to that, Mr. One, Simpson? One more, if that's, yes, if that's okay. Ahead, yeah. yeah. Um, so, in terms of uh, de decentralising, um, are we talking about handing powers from councils uh, to communities, wh whatever we mean by communities? Um, perhaps you could confirm that. And is there any, anything in your thinking about decentralising powers from this place to councils? Um, convener, I think, um, first of all, uh, I should reiterate uh, the government's uh, intention about community empowerment. Um, the Community Empowerment Act, as far as I'm concerned, uh, was uh, a flagship piece of legislation uh, that went through um, the last parliament. And during the course uh, of its formulation, uh, the predecessor committee to this one uh, went right across the country to talk to people uh, about their experiences uh, and where they thought things were going well uh, and where uh, they thought things were going uh, not so well. Uh, and I, I, I think it would be fair to say uh, that the predecessor committee itself had a major role to play in the formulation of the bill uh, with many of the amendments put forward by the committee being accepted uh, and now uh, of course are part of the act uh, which will we'll roll out as I, I said earlier. One of the things which became extremely apparent as we were going around the country is that in many places um, people felt very, very distanced um, from the local authority. And I'll give um, the committee a, a couple of examples, if I may, convener. 
Um, we were in Loch Haber um, as a committee. We went to, to Fort William, um, where uh, folks had a, a lot of views um, a, about the local authority, Highland. Um, the overriding opinion there was that Inverness seemed very, very distant. Uh, and beyond that, people seemed to be frustrated that they could not take control over various services themselves. And I'll give you an example there. Um, there were a group of folk who I spoke to who wanted to deal uh, with the winter clearing services in their area uh, because they felt that the council were not doing uh, a good enough job. Now, I can see absolutely no difficulty in that kind of thing happening. Also, um, we went to um, the, the Western Isles, um, and it was quite surprising to hear um, uh, from those folks from the, the Southern Ire Islands how distanced they felt from Stornoway. Uh, and one of the things which has happened since then um, is that uh, in terms of participatory budgeting, uh, folks from those islands um, have taken part in a participatory budgeting scheme there, um, where uh, quite brave of Kenyon and Yellen Shear, and I apologise to the Gaelic speakers out there for probably my mispronunciation, but they were brave that kind. So in terms of um, allowing the community there um, to uh, take part in a, a budgeting process for transport, um, half a million pounds worth of contracts where the community themselves, I understand, help shape um, the new transport systems there. Um, half a million pounds, I understand that they reduced the amount of contracts from 14 uh, to four. Uh, that happened in recent times, and I think it will be uh, an idea for us to go and analyze the benefits of having that community involvement uh, in that. But these are the kind of things that I would like to see happen. I am not particularly bothered uh, about lines on maps. I'm interested about what communities want, need, and desire. Okay. Uh, th thank you very much, Minister. Now, uh, and I'll let in uh, Alexander uh, Stewart, who's been very patient. Yes. Thank, thank you very much, convener. And if I can also declare an interest as a serving member of Perth and Kinross Council, and I look forward, Minister, to the challenges of the next year or so. Uh, my question co co comes on from what you've said already, and I thank you for giving us some indication that you're going to be dealing with the sort of structures and timescales uh, of reform as we move forward. Obviously, any reform has an impact on a community and could have consequences for jobs within uh, that locale. Uh, and there are a number of councils at the moment that work very collaboratively uh, or in partnership with one another, uh, sharing some services and continuing to make economies of scale across the, uh, the whole of Scotland. Uh, and, I, and I know that that has worked quite well uh, in some areas and others have found that quite challenging. Uh, so there's a, there's a, a slight uh, difference in opinion as to how that work and moves forward. Uh, but I think that it's, it's important to get a flavour, Minister, of, of, of the views uh, that the government are trying to bring forward. And if they are attempting to see that within local government at the moment, uh, we have a number of functions that take place, but probably the biggest function is education. Uh, and, and I know that there is a, a review going on in education uh, from other ministers uh, and what impact there may well be uh, with reference to education uh, within local authority. It would be useful to get a flavour uh, of the, the government's views on that uh, because I think that could have a huge impact uh, on the current system uh, and going forward uh, could show us a very different uh, organisation. Thank you. So your questions about education, well, I'm not sure if it was about shared services or local uh, government boundaries, is it specifically about education no, reform? It, it, it's, a, it's about, uh, convener, the, the whole idea of, of sharing services at the moment, that's, as I've said, is working quite well, uh, but I want to know if there's any, any opinions and views about education, because that is one of the biggest things that local government have to manage at present, uh, and the government may have some views on that or they may not, uh, and I'm just testing the, the water to see if there's any views. Minister, views on education. <laughs> well, education doesn't fall into my portfolio. That. Um, convener. What I would say uh, about uh, shared services is that uh, many local authorities uh, have uh, worked in partnership to share services, which has worked very, very well uh, in many, many places. Um, it's led to uh, savings uh, in, uh, in many cases, which 
uh, has meant that money uh, could be uh, put back into frontline services, which of course is beneficial uh, to, to people. Um, uh, and I think there are uh, some very good examples uh, across the country um, where that has worked. Um, the Aberdeen City and Shire Joint Procurement Unit is one of the best examples that I can give, uh, which is, uh, I, I don't know how, mu how much money it saved over the course, um, but it has also uh, ensured that money has been diverted back into frontline services. I know that uh, a number of local authorities, unfortunately, um, have not moved uh, towards that cooperative uh, sharing uh, scenario. Uh, I would encourage others to do so. One of the things which I am immensely keen in doing is ensuring um, that uh, best practice is exported right throughout the country. Uh, one of the things which uh, I'm sure you'll probably find as a committee uh, is that you will hear a number of very, very good things that are going on at a local level. Uh, but you ask um, folk who they have shared that with and whether that's being replicated elsewhere uh, and you get a blank. Uh, so just because, I mean, the, uh, uh, the question eventually ended up on education, which I know is not within your remit, but I suppose as the Minister for uh, Local Government and Communities, where do you see your role in relation to any impact on local authorities that any education reform may may bring? I, I think that's maybe where uh, I was Mr Stewart to get was getting towards. <laughs> yep, I'm I sure will. there's wonderful practice everywhere across Scotland and around communities, and this committee will go and we'll, we'll look at that for ourselves, Mr Stewart. But just, just in terms of where you see your role as a Minister for Local Government in relation to any potential reforms with education? Well, the First Minister um, stated uh, in her first speech to Parliament that this would be uh, a cross-cutting government. Uh, obviously, there will be discussions uh, between myself uh, and the Deputy First Minister um, as Cabinet Secretary um, for Education, but also uh, as the lead for uh, public sector reform, which he is. Uh, obviously, before the government embarks on that journey, as I've made very, very clear indeed, uh, there will be consultation uh, on all of these matters, which the people uh, and stakeholders uh, will hopefully uh, feed into. Um, so I, I can assure the committee uh, that the government will work in a cross-cutting basis uh, and uh, these discussions will be held across government, but more importantly, uh, before there are moves uh, to, to change things, we will, as always, consult. Okay, Minister Elaine Smith, do you want to follow up on that? If you don't mind, just a kind of specific question to the Minister on that then. So, Minister, are you aware if there are any plans at all to look at removing skills from local authority control? And if there were, would your remit as a Minister then give you an interest in that? Um, my remit as a, a Minister gives me an interest on many, many things. Um, it has been uh, a little bit of an eye-opener um, for me uh, to see how much information is actually shared uh, across government um, uh, and how often uh, I am asked for uh, my opinion. I think that's uh, a particularly good thing. Um, uh, and I am working uh, in cooperation uh, with uh, numerous cabinet secretaries and ministers at this time on very, very many issues. Um, so obviously, um, as if, if there is any decisions made, um, I, I will obviously uh, catch sight of that. My opinion will no doubt be asked for, uh, and I will give uh, that opinion. But the key thing in all of this, convener, and I, I cannot emphasise this enough, is in terms of reform that we bring forward, uh, the key thing is to listen to the public in particular and see what their needs uh, and desires are. And I think as a, as a government, um, we have a, a fairly good uh, record in doing so. Uh, and, you know, that's one of the reasons why uh, we, we've got that uh, flagship Community Empowerment uh, Act, which was passed in the, in the last parliament. Elaine, I know it was a supplementary, but do you want to come back on that? 
Uh, no, I think uh, the Minister has, has answered it as much as he can at the moment. I have to say, uh, convener, I cannot answer about every single aspect of education because that is not within my remit. No, so I, I thought that we were more driving towards that uh, if, uh, if the reforms in education was to have a direct impact on the wider local government remit, you would be in the room making those decisions rather than finding out the consequences of those decisions, I think. As I said, the government works in a cross-cutting way, um, so I would be uh, notified uh, given the information uh, and uh, my uh, responses, I, I'm sure, would be um, taken into account. But I think the key thing, as I always have said right along throughout this meeting and will continue to say throughout this parliamentary term, the key thing for me is getting a, this right for the people of Scotland. Now, um, the Minister's not here to talk in education policy, of course, but his, his remit is local government communities uh, and housing minister. Um, is this on education? Well, it, yes, it, yes, it is, Can Chair. It focused. But it, yeah. it, it's very focused. It's very quick because um, education is, as you know, a massive part of local government. Um, straight question, Minister. Is it the government's intention to review the education funding formula? Um, the government's intention um, is to review the education fund funding formula uh, and uh, we will establish uh, a new fair and transparent funding for formula so that schools have clarity uh, about the level of funding they will receive, uh, which will enable them to plan for the future uh, and the government intends to ensure that funding goes directly to head teachers. Uh, in, in a moment, I, um, Mr Gibson, was your supplementary on education? It's also? not supplementary, it's about local government reform. Right, so we'll, we'll, we'll take Elaine first and then we'll come back to that. Okay. Well, thanks very much, Convener. So specifically on the, the review of the funding for uh, education, in which case, with the attainment fund, as I understand, 100 million of that would be found from council tax, uh, whilst the rest would be from the government. But I have to ask then, Minister, on that, would, how would that work? Would, um, would the government be then asking councils with more council tax? So, so, for example, areas with bigger houses would perhaps be paying more, and therefore would that then be spread out to areas where the attainment fund was more needed? And how exactly would you envisage that working? And also, um, how, how, how would that play out for councils? rights, if you like, to raise their own council tax and spend it? I think all of... I'm not sure it's a supplementary, but a very valid question. I, 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 and one that probably doesn't fo fall into my portfolio, <laughs> uh, convener. Um, as I, as I, I said, um, it is the government's intention to review um, the, the uh, formula. Um, as part of that review, um, you know, these details will be teased out, I am sure. I do not have um, the detail of that. That does not fall uh, into to my remit. That's fine, Minister. I'm, I'm, I think we've got the most patient member of the committee in Mary Evans, who I'm now going to take in. <laughs> no, thank you. Yeah, it was just really in relation to some of the other things that, that you'd mentioned today. I mean, you talked about the... Um, uh, sorry, the participatory budgeting and also the charrette process too. Uh, I know from my own local authority, we'd uh, rolled out the charrettes in most of the towns, well, within uh, the Angus council area anyway. Um, but, and I do, I think that's been a very positive process on the whole and a good way to get to get people involved in the fact that it looks at external organisations and isn't just necessarily run by the council like some of these events have tended to be. I think the main issue though has been in, you know, what we've already discussed is, uh, yeah, I think we get a lot of interested people at the start of that, but then it's, the, it's what happens after, uh, which has turned out to be the most frustrating thing. And I know that's down to local authorities themselves and you know performance varies from local authority to local authority, but it's the ability to act on what comes out of the charrette process, which has been the, the frustrating thing for communities now. And I mean, we talked about the local development plans and uh, Bob, your earlier point about you know, I think a lot of people would like to buy into this process, but it's about, well, how can you buy into it if you don't know what's happening in the first place? And that whole communication issue, again, that varies from local authority to local authority. Um, but I think a central part of that as well is the community planning partnerships. 
you know, we have, uh, again, I think uh, performance probably varies between them, but in, in some areas, it is still very much a top-down approach rather than the, the bottom-up that it's it's designed to be. And I would really just like to tease out your, your thoughts on that and how you think that the that process can be better developed and improved. Because at the moment, again, there's lots of communities who are desperate to buy into these things but don't know what's going on and don't know how these decisions are being made. Uh, thank you, Convener. Uh, and uh, I thank Ms Evans for her questions, of which there were many there. Um, if I, I could start off by uh, talking about the charrette process, um, I have to say that a number of years ago attending a, a charrette as a councillor, I, I went there a little bit cynical, it has to be said, um, and I came out very, very enthused indeed, as did the folks who attended that uh, event. Um, people felt uh, that they were part of the process. Um, it was uh, extremely exciting for many folk because it, it was the first time that they'd felt part of the process. Um, and I hope that we can continue on uh, in planning terms using charrettes and other um, community engagement tools um, to make sure um, that uh, we do the right things in, in many areas. Participatory budgeting is um, something which is also uh, for me, very exciting. Um, I, I talked about the Kenyan and Yellen Shear situation. Um, recently, a, a number of, uh, of uh, these kind of schemes, uh, which have already happened, crossed my desk, um, which schemes which uh, basically came from the, the last uh, lot of community choices fund money. Uh, and while full analysis has not been done uh, on, on many of these things yet, it seems that people themselves have felt really empowered being uh, involved uh, in some of, of these um, schemes. And I think that's uh, uh, really, really beneficial to all. Just uh, last week, um, the, uh, the new £2 million Community Choices Fund was launched. Uh, it targeted particularly at work in deprived areas. Uh, and the fund's aim is to build on the support provided uh, by the Scottish Government for uh, participatory, participatory budgeting since 2014. Uh, and that will open up opportunities for other public authorities, community organisations uh, and community councils. Convener, I would uh, ask for all members uh, of the committee uh, and all members of the Parliament as a whole uh, to actually advertise uh, the Community Choices Fund, mm -hmm. um, that we can circulate the details to you. But I want to see communities the length and breadth of Scotland uh, bidding to become part of this. Uh, and beyond that, you know, uh, my, my aim is to ensure um, that councils set that minimum 1% target. I think everybody will gain from this. Um, my own experience of, of uh, in a past life as a councillor where you have the community involved in shaping services, where you have the community uh, involved in how money is spent, uh, where you give them the de decision-making ability, uh, the end is normally very, very good. You normally end up with a service that is much, much better uh, because people know what they want. And the thing for me is that uh, in terms of following uh, the public pound, uh, the public are often the best people to do it. Uh, and if you've got a community uh, who uh, wants to ensure that their priorities are met, they scrutinise uh, to, to the nth degree. And I've probably rabbit, rabbited on too much in that, and I've forgotten the last part of Ms Evans's question, Convener. Yeah, just about the community planning partnerships. Ah, yeah, oh, sorry. Um, yeah, I think uh, in terms of community planning partnerships, and you'll have seen from the legacy document of the previous committee, uh, that we've done a, a large amount of work around about uh, community planning partnerships. There are areas where community planning partnerships work extremely well. Um, I'm sure that you will find out as a committee uh, that where they work well is where there is the bottom-up approach, where communities have a real say uh, in what is happening in that area 
where they are influencing not only local authorities, uh, but the health board, the police, uh, and other agencies in their areas. Um, I think that there are lessons to be learned because those community planning partnerships who are maybe doing less well, who are still taking the top-down approach, uh, they should look uh, to their compatriots who are, have taken the other route uh, because they are working much, much better. I hope, convener, um, uh, that we get to a point where that exporting of best practice, where that uh, uh, bottom-up from communities approach is happening everywhere, I think that is beneficial uh, to all, will be beneficial to all. Uh, and I hope that as a committee, it's not for me to tell you uh, what to do, of course, but I hope you will look at that legacy paper uh, and you will look at the work round about that uh, and you may do some follow-ups to that. Um, uh, but as I say, that's a matter for you and not for me. Okay. Mary, do you want to come back in? Well, it wasn't so much a supplementary, but a, a different question, so I don't know if you could... A different question in, in a moment. Yeah, but no, that's fine. Minister, you mentioned um, you think it's important. Well, you said that some community planning partnerships are performing well, some are doing fairly poorly, and the ones that perform well have a bottom-up approach. Less well, I think. Well, less well. We can, we, can, we can agree that some should be doing far better than they should be doing. Um, and you mentioned that the less well community planning partnerships should be learning from the ones that are doing well. As, as Minister for Local Government, do you feel you have a role to make sure that best practice is shared? And how would you intend taking that forward as Minister? Um, I always uh, will encourage the exporting of best practice and I will do all that I possibly can to ensure that uh, information is shared. Um, uh, I will be writing uh, to all community planning partnerships uh, in the next couple of days about uh, an issue uh, which arose at a, a round table meeting uh, that I attended yesterday. Um, where uh, we find bre best practice, and I'm saying we, I'm talking about me as the minister uh, and the government, but also you as a committee, I think that we have got uh, an obligation to actually ensure uh, that that best practice is exported and shared across the board. Um, I would urge you not only just to rely um, on the government uh, in this regard to export that best practice, but I would urge you to, to look at the past work of this committee when it comes to community planning partnerships, when it comes to benchmarking, to ensure that best practice goes right across community planning partnerships and right across local authorities. Of course, uh, this committee will do that, but it's this committee's responsibility to scrutinise the Scottish Government Minister responsible for making sure and that you have happens. One moment, Minister, and that would be yourself. So it's great that you're having that round table event. If there's a need to review guidance and structures of community planning partnerships, are you prepared to do that? And will you come to this committee and give us more information on how you want to ensure best practice is shared? As you will be aware, um, convener, uh, the Community Empowerment Act itself had a number of uh, bits and pieces in that legislation dealing with community planning partnerships. As I said, the guidance uh, around about that is currently being uh, consulted upon and worked up uh, at this moment in time. Uh, obviously, um, if I think that there is uh, a necessity um, to ensure that something else needs to be done uh, to get to the point of uh, that information being shared and uh, best practice being exported, then I will do so. Um, uh, in, in terms of uh, being where you sat, uh, convener, uh, I made that uh, one of the things which uh, uh, was top of the pile uh, as far as I was concerned. Uh, I think we have had in the past um, uh, an inability in certain cases um, across the public sector to share best practice. I intend to ensure that best practice is shared. Um, and I, 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 I think that from my answer there, you have that assurance. Okay, so we have the assurance that if structures have to change or statutory guidance has to be given to make sure that what, happens, that will happen. What, what I, I, as I said earlier, I'm not particularly interested in structures and lines, but guidance uh, is often good in terms of dealing uh, with these things. Guidance for the Community Empowerment Act uh, is still being worked up. Uh, if there needs to be any change to ensure that best practice is sh shared and exported, 
I will certainly look at that. It would be helpful if you were to write to the committee, maybe to give us some examples of best practice and how the Scottish Government is ensuring that is shared. I think that would give us a starting point as a committee to look at this. That's further. not a problem at all, convener. That's great. Uh, now, I know we want to look at local government funding. And, uh, so, so can I have a yeah. supplementary on that yeah, sure. yeah, okay. just cool. Thank, Thanks, convener. Yeah, it was just very, very quickly, convener. First of all, I would say trying to get the local print media to cover your £2 million fund is a lot easier said than done. Uh, but in terms of community choice participation, the, the 1%, I mean, I think that's very significant. In my relatively small local authority area, it'd be over £3.5 million a year. But when would you like to see that fully rolled out? Uh, I would like local authorities to, to move to this as soon as possible, um, uh, Mr Gibson. I, I think it's advantageous um, uh, for local authorities uh, to do that sooner rather than later. As I said, I've got a, a, a very strong belief that um, when the public is allowed to help shape services, we end up with better services, uh, at normally um, at much less cost, which means that money can be reinvested in other frontline services. So I would encourage local authorities um, and other public sector bodies um, to, to look to moving to participatory budgeting as soon as. Now, we are going to move on to local government funding, but I know, Mary Evans, you said you had another theme you wish to raise with the, the Minister. Oh, yeah, it's uh, a, a hugely important issue at the moment, and I know it's a huge area of concern for, um, for local authorities, and that's really the impact of the referendum on the structural funds and the transnational programmes. Uh, so, really, I, I have a few questions within that, really. I mean, there's obviously the leader, the rural development programme, and the d distribution of those funds. I think it's uh, just a case of of business as usual at the moment or uh, do we, can you offer any reassurances there to local government um, and I also believe that your own constituency was you know the biggest beneficiary in the UK over the, the last funding period for the transnational programs obviously that brings in hundreds of millions to our local economy and is largely dealt with through local government and it is just really I think a lot of bids are going in for the are in the middle or we're in the midst of uh, those bids for the transnational programs at the moment such as interreg uh, and pro programs like that. So it is really in terms of the structural funds, uh, the transnational programs, uh, just really what you're thinking on that. And again, like I say, what reassurances we can offer to, to local government at the moment? Um, well, I, I think uh, the impact of Friday's uh, result has not filtered all of the way through yet. Um, and uh, I, I wish the First Minister well uh, in Europe today and uh, hopefully uh, we will reach a, a position where uh, Scotland can remain within the European Union uh, and that we don't have to uh, worry too much uh, about these things because we will retain uh, that membership. Um, but, you know, local government uh, was allocated up to one third of the 1.3 billion EU structural funds um, that were coming to Scotland between 2014 and 2020. Uh, the total direct local government funding was uh, somewhere in the region of 293 million euros, 230 million pounds. Uh, and that included funding to uh, invest in local, regional and regional businesses uh, with growth potential. And that was through the business gateway, some 40 million euros there. Uh, 15 million euros for Seven Smart Cities Alliance. Um, and 138 million euros for employability um, work. Uh, and of course, as um, uh, Ms Evans has mentioned, uh, there's the European Offshore Wind Development Centre monies which uh, came to, to, uh, to Aberdeen. Um, I am unable to give you an in-depth answers on this at this moment in time. But what I will do is um, uh, we will Write, I will write to the committee um, with all of the detail of all of the funding that uh, may uh, be at risk. Uh, and beyond that, um, we will keep the committee uh, updated um, as uh, things become uh, more apparent in that sphere, um, convener. Um, but I reiterate what I said. I hope that um, Scotland um, can remain uh, within the European Union, uh, so none of that funding is put at risk. Um, thank you. Uh, Andy Whiteman? 
Yes, I just want to ask a question about fuel poverty and energy efficiency. So it's a new topic. Well, well it's yeah. a new topic I was taking you in yeah. for. Um, thank you, uh, convener. The upcoming November 2016 statutory deadline for meeting the op <laughs> for meeting the objective of eradicating fuel poverty set by the Housing Scotland Act 2001 is both likely to, to, to not be met and will obviously be focusing attention back on this very important uh, topic. Um, what plans do you have to try and make sure that we don't have a target set in future that hasn't, hasn't been met and to, uh, to, to inject some urgency into the question of fuel poverty? Um, con convener, um, this government is uh, committed uh, to tackling fuel poverty uh, and ensuring everyone in Scotland lives in a warm home that is uh, affordable uh, to heat. Um, we all continue to work with stakeholders uh, as we take forward our commitment to introduce a, a warm homes bill. Uh, in addition uh, to considering the recommendation uh, from the Expert Commission Special Working Group on Regulation of District Heating. Uh, it would also be helpful uh, for us to consider the recommendations from the Scottish Rural Fuel Poverty Task Force uh, and the Scottish Fuel Poverty Strategic Working Group, who are both expected to report on their findings by the end of the calendar year. Uh, yes. Thank you. <laughs> um, this target hasn't been met. We still have high levels of fuel poverty. Um, I was asking about the kind of urgency with which you intend to tackle this. Obviously, it is a cross-cutting uh, issue um, across your portfolio, energy portfolio, climate change, etc. Um, I mean, do you have any idea about when you would wish now to eradicate fuel poverty? Well, can I say to um, the committee, um, that I met uh, just yesterday afternoon with David Sigsworth, who's the chair of the Scottish Fuel Poverty Strategic Working Group. Um, it's that group's view that uh, despite uh, the Scottish Government's significant investment over, of over half a billion pounds since 2009 to our fuel poverty and energy efficiency programme, the ambitious tar target to eradicate fuel poverty by November will not be met, as uh, Mr Whiteman has said. Uh, therefore, based uh, on the advice that we have now received from experts across the, center, uh, the sector, uh, we must accept that uh, fuel poverty will not be eradicated this year. Uh, we are committed to continuing our efforts in this area, and uh, I will continue to work with the stakeholders to review the Fuel Poverty Action Plan, including the Fuel Poverty Eradication Target. Uh, this will include, as I said earlier, the recommendations from the Scottish Rural Fuel Poverty Task Force and Fuel Poverty Strategic Working Group, who are both due to issue final reports on their findings by the end of the calendar year. Convener, um, they were challenging targets, and uh, um, we would have been near meeting those targets if it hadn't been for the fact of uh, huge increases um, in uh, fuel bills. Um, but as I say, I will continue to work with stakeholders uh, to review um, these matters, and it is a, 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 it is a, a priority um, for this government uh, to continue to eradicate fuel poverty opportunity to come back one final time. Anything else to add? Uh, Elaine Smith. Thanks very much, Convener. Um, Minister, it's just to take you back slightly to an issue around housing. And I'm sure uh, we'll all have noticed in, in recent years that um, we have seen an increase in people sleeping rough, not just in our cities, but actually in other areas as well. So, for example, in my own community, I've noticed this where previously it may not have been so much the case. So my question is around this, um, obviously I take on board everything you've said about housing, it's very important, but what about the lack of accommodation for people that are sleeping rough? So for example, it's meaning that church groups are opening up church halls, etc., to try and help people. So do you have any plans to, to look at this issue and see whether help for accommodation for people sleeping rough can be increased? 
Convener, um, Scotland has some of the most progressive homelessness legislation uh, in the world. Um, and since 2012, uh, all those assessed as being homeless uh, through no fault of their own are entitled to settled accommodation. Uh, this does not happen anywhere else uh, in the UK. Um, the Scottish Government has uh, promoted a housing options approach uh, which focuses on preventing homelessness uh, in the first place. Um, to do this, um, five local authority-led housing options hubs were created, uh, which enabled all 32 local authorities to share learning and practice. Uh, the hubs have received uh, £1 million of funding since 2010-11, uh, and we're providing £150,000 of ongoing support um, for 2016-17. Now, I take um, uh, uh, the Deputy Convener's point uh, about rough sleepers. Um, what I can say is one of the first meetings um, that I had as Minister um, was uh, around about homelessness. Um, I am keen uh, to ensure that the best possible actions are taken uh, to uh, ensure uh, that we do our very best um, for people. Um, Ms Dix was uh, at that meeting, if I remember uh, rightly. Um, one of the things which is frustrating um, for me is often we see local authority uh, boundaries as a barrier um, to finding solutions um, for for folk uh, and good outcomes for folk. And I'm keen to see um, a cross-cutting approach to try and deal with homelessness um, as a whole. Um, uh, maybe Miss Dix would like to come in um, and add a little bit more meat to the bone there. Yeah, yeah. Mr Stewart, my apologies. Miss Dix, can, can we like in a second if that's okay, Minister? I think I uh, Elaine had a very specific follow-up on that. I just felt it maybe be better following up, Minister, and then maybe Miss Dix could come in overall. Um, I was a Member of Parliament when that excellent homelessness legislation was passed, and as a former homelessness officer, I've certainly very much welcomed that legislation at the time. And I do welcome your commitment to this. I'm really pleased to hear it. But of course, the, the problem is, that although people have legal rights, it's very difficult for people who are sleeping rough to get a lawyer. There's not enough maybe uh, legal, legal centres about that can help them. So even if people can get a letter from a law centre, for example, then actually taking that to the council, then yes, they might be accommodated. But for a lot of councils, they just don't seem to have the accommodation. I think that's a bit of a, that's a big problem, actually. So I wanted to add that further before um, Caroline Dix comes in. Um, there's two main points there. I, I, there's ongoing discussion, uh, I have to say, um, Deputy Convener, uh, about people who sleep, sleep rough, um, who often, as you have pointed out, have multiple and complex needs. Um, it's generally accepted that in order to meet their needs, needs, a range of services need to work together, um, including health, homelessness and social work. Uh, and I am keen to ensure um, that that happens across the board. Beyond that, you mentioned supported accommodation there too. Um, the worrying thing is that the UK government is currently reviewing its funding uh, and there is a major threat to some of the uh, provision to, to be able to continue to be pro provided. Um, we as a government will continue to press the UK government uh, to ensure that supported accommodation is exempt um, from any changes. Uh, a review of supported accommodation commissioned by DWP uh, and DCLG um, is due to be published. Uh, the UK government will announce some mitigation measures um, to be used in the short term. Longer term approaches will be subject to a formal consultation. Um, I wonder if I could bring in Miss Dix now, who will add to, to my comments, convener. Um, 
my direct area of responsibility isn't homelessness, but we work quite closely with colleagues um, in terms of looking at the supply of more homes uh, across all local authority areas and making sure uh, the processes uh, for getting the links between, for example, uh, the housing associations and the councils um, to, to make sure that homeless applicants get access <coughs> to those new homes. I know that there is consideration of, as the Minister has said, uh, about what's happening at the moment in terms of rough sleeping and how all the agencies are working together. So we can maybe give the committee an update on, on the current discussions and what's happening with that. If you're happy, convener, I'm quite happy to write to the committee with the updates of the work that is ongoing at this moment in time. That would be very helpful, Minister, and I'll discipline myself from asking a supplementary in relation to that, what's going to be around housing allocations policy. But I've got a question in the chamber this afternoon. That's I'll leave it until, I'll, I'll in, in, that this afternoon, in, until that point. Now, it, time is almost upon us. I'm going to move to our final area. I'm afraid, Mr Whiteman, and it's in relation to planning. A couple of members had indicated they wish to, to, to raise that, so I'll maybe take Graham Simpson on on that, unless you've... No, absolutely fine, thanks. a look fine, of kind of blank horror on your no, face. No, because I was going to ask something there. else, but uh, <laughs> well, we'll, we'll go for planning. OK. Um, so the previous uh, indicated planning was something you'd... So yeah, no, that's absolutely... I thought we were going to discuss reform of local government, uh, which is a kind of reasonably important topic for the local government committee. Well, it is, and members have had lots of opportunities to raise that, and we're now at 11.21, mm, and they, they, have they haven't raised it. So, yeah, I, 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 I've offered, uh, just one moment, I've, I've offered Mr Simpson the opportunity to a question he may wish to ask about <coughs> reform of local government, if he wishes to. We, we can do anything. Well, you're the, you're the member of call, so if you, uh, if so you say we can do anything, we can, I'm happy to. We can Mr. go Gibson, for reform of local Mr. government. Mr Gibson, if, if Mr Simpson's not bothered, why don't I take you in and ask a question? Okay, well, thanks very much. Um, I mean, I just want to know how open the Scottish Government is to a bold and radical transformation of local government. I asked a First Minister's question about the time scale and understand that the, this, you're going to be moving towards this uh, towards the end of the year, but you'll be aware that I, I did have a resolution to the SNP's last conference on this because with uh, local government budgets uh, being under severe pressure and declining, uh, uh, frankly, year on year and the funding pressure is likely to continue, how sustainable are 32 local authorities? Uh, and 14 health boards, and wouldn't it be more sensible to look at bringing uh, the health boards under democratic control by merging uh, local authorities and health boards, allowing strategic decision-making in terms of economic development, social work and health, while at the same time devolving issues such as planning, street cleaning, uh, control of museums, street lighting, etc., down to communities to give the communities those, those, the kind of input that you want them uh, to have. So, um, I'd be interested in your views. There is, of course, a lot of bureaucracy which people don't understand in local government, community planning partnerships, health and social care integrations, joint integration boards. It would be a lot easier, surely, to, uh, to look again at this entire Can I just issue. Take a little bit longer to answer that <laughs> question, Minister. Thanks, Convener. Okay, and can I say, Convener, that if there are any other questions that we don't get to today, because I'm aware that time is pushing on, um, if the committee wants to write to me, I will respond accordingly. Um, as I said um, uh, previously, Convener, um, the uh, public sector reform uh, agenda uh, sits in the Deputy First Minister's uh, remit. Um, but if I could say that uh, the government's aim um, is to transform um, our democratic landscape, uh, protect and renew public services, uh, and refresh the relationship between citizens, communities, uh, councils and other public bodies. Uh, we'll work with local authorities to review their roles and responsibilities uh, and get more power into the hands of communities uh, and we will consult on uh, and introduce um, a decentralisation bill. Uh, a review of the roles and responsibilities of local government is in line uh, with well-established uh, public discussion uh, that has gone on, uh, including arguments that have been made uh, by the 2014 uh, COSLA Commission uh, on uh, strengthening local democracy. 
Uh, the government has already recognised that uh, the right solutions for people uh, may differ across uh, Scotland's uh, diverse communities, uh, and we will take that, of course, into account. Uh, but the key thing in all of this um, is that consultation um, with the people that I mentioned earlier. Yeah. Uh, uh, one thing you didn't mention was whether uh, health could perhaps be integrated with local government. I mean, for example, Fife Council and Fife Health Board have exactly the same coterminous boundaries. Um, surely it would make uh, sense, given uh, the joint integration, to have democratic control of that through one structure rather than two, for example. As I say, um, this area uh, sits with Mr Swinney. Um, I will pass on Mr Gibson's comments to, to the Deputy First Minister, although I'm quite sure that the Deputy First Minister is all, already aware of Mr Gibson's views. That, that's very helpful, Minister, but it also raises a, an interesting point about there's many things that will have a direct impact on local government. Uh, and whilst some matters of reform will not be directly within your remit, it will have a direct impact and consequence on local government. And I think what Mr Gibson was saying there, and what I was saying in previous questioning, is to make sure a local government minister or cabinet secretary is in the room co-producing what these reforms may look like rather than having to deal with the impact of them. I suppose that's maybe the point. As I have reiterated a number of times today, um, the First Minister has said that this will be a cross-cutting government. People will work, not work in isolation. Um, I said already that it's been an eye-opener um, for me in terms of the amount of um, information that is shared and joint decision-making that is going on uh, in the Scottish Government. Um, um, I, I, I'm sure that that will continue. It is, of course, with, within uh, the, the committee's uh, right to, to, to call other uh, ministers and cabinet secretaries to talk about their areas of responsibility. Absolutely. Mr Simpson, do you want to come in on this topic? Um, yes, I mean, we've obviously uh, we, we've tried to uh, tease out some answers on local government reform. You're clearly not ready, <laughs> ready to give those answers yet, but uh, uh, and I understand that. Um, but you did say earlier um, in relation to education funding that you want to uh, hand the funding directly to schools. Now, if that is to happen, uh, clearly that has a knock-on effect or could have a knock-on effect to council budgets. Um, are you talking about taking schools out of council control um, and handing them to, well, in effect, yourself, if you're... You know, if the Scottish Government is handing out the money, that does have an effect on local local council budgets. Um, well, as I said earlier, uh, when I was given the answers uh, about the education funding situation, um, these things will be consulted upon, uh, and that falls within the remit of the Deputy First Minister in terms of the education aspects of, of all of this. Um, I, I think that if you, uh, and I don't, forgive me, Convener, I don't know um, the remits of the committee that have been decided by the Business Bureau. Um, but, you know, in terms of the public sector reform agenda, I, I, I'm sure that you have the ability to call the Deputy First Minister in these regards, if you so wish. Absolutely. Cross-cutting in our approach. Mr Gibson, Tiny question just no, to ask. I, unfortunately, I believe that uh, council tax reform and finance of local government is also a pretty meaty issue that I know Andy Whiteman wishes to raise mm -hmm. as okay. a final theme for, the, for this morning. Thank you, Convener. Um, yes, this is just very brief. Obviously, we'll have future conversations on this topic, but you mentioned in your opening remarks that you uh, haven't got responsibility for local government finance. That sits with the Finance Secretary. But um, it is correct, isn't it, that you have responsibility for local tax reform? all aspects of local government finance sit with the finance secretary. So are you therefore not in a position to give us any indication as to whether the government's proposals, current proposals of a council tax reform will be being brought forward? Um, the uh, government's proposals uh, uh, will be brought forward, I'm sure, by the finance secretary in, in the near future. Anything additional you 
there's nothing more you would wish to ask on that theme. I see Mr Gibson's quite key. Are you, uh, uh, can I say to fellow committee members, if ever you do not make eye contact with me to ask a question, Mr Gibson will always fill that gap. <laughs> uh, uh, Mr Gibson. Thank you, thank you convener. It's a very, very uh, precise uh, question, a very small one. Uh, and this is something which um, all the councillors uh, at this table will have uh, been um, exercised by in the past. And that's the issue of randomised ballots at next year's local authority elections, because all else being equal, if you and I were to stand in a completely new ward, I, uh, well, for the same party, I would be elected rather than you, assuming nobody knew who we were. They just looked at the party labels. In, 19, in 2007, 92% right. of people higher up the alphabet were, were selected over party colleagues. Surely the democratic way um, to do this uh, next year, to, to avoid all this nonsense, is to randomise the ballot papers so that someone called Mr Simpson has exactly the same chance as Mr Doris, assuming they were standing for the same party in the same area. <laughs> but, so I strike that from the record. Minister, could you, could you answer that question? Um, I, I've heard this uh, argument before and uh, s certainly there was some work done after the first STV elections in 2007 um, which showed uh, that you were more likely to be elected if your name was further up the ar alphabet. That's not so much the case in 2011, um, uh, if I remember rightly. Um, so, so why uh, uh, Mr Gibson, we'll let you away with that one, maybe through the chair in the future, and can I remind Sorry, the Minister he's not here to answer on behalf um, of the Scottish uh, National Party, but uh, the Scottish uh, Government? I, I have no idea why the um, SNP chose to use Robson's uh, rotation. Um, convener, I, I wonder, I have to say that I haven't looked in depth at any of this, um, and as I said earlier, and it's, it sounds like I'm deflecting a lot today and I'm not trying to, but all elections uh, come under uh, Mr Fitzpatrick as Minister for Parliamentary Business, um, as I said at the very beginning of the meeting. Um, so it might be best to address that question to him uh, rather than to me, because he will be dealing with all aspects of elections. Okay, thank you. My colleague Elaine Smith has got a question, which I'm sure you won't deflect, Minister. You'd be very keen to answer. Thank you, Convener. And it is a supplementary to Mr. the point Mr. Gibson raised. <laughs> and I do note that you said Mr. Fitzpatrick is responsible for uh, the boundary issues. But do, given that it affects your remit with 10 months to go to, a local, go to local government elections, do you have any idea? Minister, when the Scottish Government will be announcing the changes to the boundaries, I the result of the boundary I, review? I, I don't have uh, an indication of timescale, uh, but what I will do, Convener, um, is I will uh, ask Mr Fitzpatrick uh, to write to the committee to give an indication. Many thanks. Okay. Now, uh, Minister, um, time, is, well, time is upon us. Um, can I thank yourself and uh, your colleagues for... Uh, coming along and, and giving evidence to the committee th this morning. We're very keen to uh, work in partnership with, with yourself uh, and your officials uh, in the best interests of, 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 of the electorate that we all wish to, uh, uh, to, to, to do a job for. Um, uh, we will be considering our, our work programme going forward j through the course of the summer, and I'm sure we will have you back in the, in the very near future. But today was really about getting general themes aired and getting to know you as Minister and getting to know us as, as a committee. And I'm sure we'll have a constructive relationship going forward. I'm happy to um, give you any additional or final comments you may wish to put on the record before we move into private session. Uh, I don't have very much more to say other than to wish you all of the very best uh, on this committee. Um, I enjoyed serving on the predecessor committee. Um, I hope that you enjoy your work uh, and your scrutiny as much as I did. Um, thank you very much, Minister, and thank you all of you for coming along. Now, before we do move into private session, can I just put the, the, the following on the record for the benefit of members and anyone listening uh, out, out with this place? The Understanding Order Rule 12.6.2, this committee will require to appoint an EU reporter, but this decision will be put to members after the summer recess. So just in case anyone outside there is watching and going, this committee hasn't appointed an EU uh, reporter yet, we most definitely will do. We think it's crucial that we continue to do that and we'll make that appointment after the summer recess. And with that, we now move into private session as agreed on the 15th of June. Thank you.